declaring the end from the beginning. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Bear fruit to God that your fruit should remain. A heartful hello everyone and thanks for tuning in. I hope this video finds you in shalom, thoughts of love and harmony in your home. In this presentation, we will add a layer of perspective in understanding our soul in the person of Eve. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, May the God of peace make you holy or set apart or sanctified in every way and may your entire or your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Yahusha HaMashiach, when he comes again. In keeping with our theme of declaring the end from the beginning, this very rich verse gives insight to the practicality of how in our entire being, that spirit, soul, and body, how we can live in peace and be kept blameless until the end. So in simple terms, in the present time, how can we be overcomers until the end? We take back this question of sanctification in the beginning. We see that sanctification of mankind started in the Garden of Eden. We see the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Have you asked a question as to why there's two trees to choose from to begin with? If the Creator didn't add a second option, we would not have had to deal with the fall of mankind. I mean, it is a valid question. I mean, if you look to the end of the book in Revelation 22, verse 2, you'll see there's no mention of a second tree. You just see the tree of life. So why go through all that trouble? If you're like me and wish to seek the deeper things of the Most High, by the end of this presentation, it is my hope to give you or share the answer that the Spirit impressed upon my heart. And I think you'll have a greater appreciation of our Heavenly Father's original perfect plan for His children in the garden. So in our quest to know the way to be overcomers in our whole being, spirit, soul, body, we will refer to the story of Adam and Eve in parables. Adam is a type of spirit. Eve is a type of soul. For now, I will leave out the body or the flesh in the typology. We will eventually make connections when we get to that part of the presentation. When you think of Adam and Eve, first thing we default to when it comes to our thinking is that they were naked and not ashamed, ate of the fruit of the tree, and the fall of mankind happened. Sin and death spread to the earth. And it's very true. This is all how it unfolded. But if we were to slow down our thinking process and pay extra attention to the little and subtle details, you might be surprised as to what you might uncover. So let's imagine before the fall, what were the living conditions in their garden home? What was it like to have walked with Heavenly Father in Eden in the cool of the day? When the Creator formed Adam and Eve, there is no doubt in our mind that Heavenly Father loved and nurtured them perfectly. I believe they were created physically mature, but they were a child at heart. Matthew 18.3 qualifies a childlike faith to be in the presence of the Creator. It says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. 
As children of the Most High, Father of Lights, He most certainly applied Proverbs 22.6 in His provision as Abba, Father, to Adam and Eve. Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we can draw from John 14.26, where it says, The Holy Spirit was teaching Adam and Eve all things. So now you ask, what was the main object lesson? Well, pretty obvious, the two trees in the middle of the garden. And you ask, what's the lesson plan then? I would like now to speculate that it would be structured as written in Isaiah 11 verse 2. The spirit of the Lord Yahuwah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear or the reverence of Yahuwah, of the Lord. Now, the seven spirit of the Most High in Isaiah 11 can be symbolized by a menorah, like a tree. Think of tree of life. Notice the vine in the middle structure. This, in my opinion, represents the spirit of Yahuwah, spirit of the Lord, where all the branches meet, representing oneness with the Father. Now, in keeping with the analogy of the lesson plan, this part, the middle structure, the vine, would symbolize maturity, completion of purpose. Now, let's look at each of the branches extending outwards. It now represents each of the lesson plans, progressive lesson plans. Heavenly Father teaches us in stages. And this process of learning or training is best done in early childhood development. Childlike faith is supported in the Word. And we're going to try to connect that with the two branches first, closest to the middle. So that's to your right. We see the spirit of understanding. And this one step to maturity is spoken of by Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood. You see that word understood? Here's that spirit of understanding. As a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. So just like how it's just one step away from reaching maturity, this is what Paul is talking about. Now over to the left, spirit of wisdom. 2 Timothy 3.15 In that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise. You see that? That wise, that spirit of wisdom, able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. On the next layer, back to the right, we see the spirit of strength. Now Luke 1 verse 8, it says the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. Spirit of strength. So you see there is a connection with childlike faith all over scripture that we can connect with the lesson plan that each of the branch represents. So now over to the left, spirit of counsel. This word counsel, Strong's H6098, etsa. It actually means purpose, device, and plan. So we think of the child King Josiah, who reigned starting at eight years of age, and we see how the Most High God moved in his decision-making in making the plans that he made throughout his reign. Now, before we take on the last two outer branches of the menorah, I want to pause and let's once again put our focus on the two trees in the garden because this will help me explain the last two outer branches. In the latter part of Genesis 2, 9, take note of the location of the two trees. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did you catch that? Both trees are in the middle. If we envision this in a more precise manner, 
Um, let's use the word center in the center of the garden. Picture a dartboard. If you look at a dartboard, you can see that there's, there can only be one center in the middle. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the center. And so I'm thinking both trees are in the center of the garden. And at this point, you may suggest, well, both trees can be positioned in the middle, but what I'd like for us to entertain the possibility of is to take the more precise approach. Both trees possibly intertwined and positioned right in the center of the garden. And you can see that there are actual trees that are intertwined like how I described it. So here's my point. Picture the tree of life surrounded or walled off by the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis 3 verse 2 and 3, by examining the text more carefully, we see Eve referring to the middle of the garden, but only referring to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's no mention of tree of life. And this is what it says in the text. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden. You see that? And, and yes, you can infer that maybe she's only singling out that forbidden tree, that one forbidden tree. But why would the text specifically say midst of the garden? And why in the first mention of both trees in Genesis 2, both trees were specifically mentioned to be positioned or situated in the midst of the garden. So is it possible that from Eve's vantage point, she's only seeing the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Well, here's something to consider further. Could it be that the creator has hid the tree of life in plain sight to test Eve? And because she needed to first earn the right to eat from it. So let's look in the end of the book and see if what I'm saying is valid. In Revelation 22, 14, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Did you catch that? So the access to the tree of life needs to be proven worthy. And blessed are those who do his commandments. And we know that the first commandment given to Adam in the garden was not to eat from that forbidden tree. So it is my opinion that Adam and Eve were being nurtured, loved, and being trained in the garden by Heavenly Father like little children. And ultimately, the Father's desire is for them to return His love. And how do they do that? By keeping His commandments. The Father is the initiator of love. And He wants genuine, He wants real fellowship, genuine love. We're not repeaters or robots. We have free will. Remember 1 John 4.19. We love him because he first loved us. How can we love the unfathomable, incomprehensible, ineffable creator? How? By loving Yahuwah, the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Mark twelve thirty. So the God of love himself, his perfect plan for his children in the garden is to perfect love in and through them. 1 John 4.17 says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Why? Why is the father looking to perfect love in Adam and Eve? Well, because the omnipotent father knows all things, knows that one day 
their love for him will be put to test. And there's this crafty serpent looking to steal, kill, and destroy. And if their love is not perfected, they will fall in fear. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Do you see that? Keeping the commandment is a responsibility of being a possessor of the Garden of Eden. Deuteronomy 8, 1, we see a little bit of the principle behind what I just said. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord Yahuwah swore to your fathers. And so the creator was training and nurturing Eve until she reached that appointed time of testing to know what's in her heart, to see if she'll keep the commandment. We see this in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, where it says, And you shall remember that the Lord, Yahuwah your God, led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So what's the deal with both trees situated in the middle of the garden? Well, I see the tree of knowledge of good and evil was put there to veil the tree of life, to cover it from Eve to test, to see if she's worthy to partake from the tree of life. And we know that Eve failed this test and she no longer, along with Adam, was worthy to eat from the tree of life. And we know that they were expelled from the garden. Genesis 3.22 says that, And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Let's examine a little further this tree of knowledge of good and evil and why I see that it could have been put there as a test for the appointed time. Genesis 3, 22 says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Pause here for a second. This is the creator himself speaking. And he's saying, behold, Adam and Eve has become like one of us. So is there something wrong with discerning good from evil? Not necessarily so. In fact, this is something that the people of faith, mature faith, is expected to have. The biggest issue here is that when Eve partook of that fruit, she did it prematurely. She has not proven her love towards the Creator as of yet, and she wasn't in a mature enough level that her reverence for the Creator was made complete or is fully given over to the Creator. This makes her very susceptible to deception. And we know that this was the case because she was beguiled by the serpent. Instead of revering the Creator, She feared and served the created or the serpent. And how did she do that? By heeding his voice. So going back to our picture image of the menorah and the teaching plan of the spirit of God, the outer branch represents the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of fear or reverence. In other words, the purpose of the spirit of knowledge is to yield the spirit of reverence or of fear. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Another requirement or condition to be a possessor of the kingdom is to have a reverence, a godly fear, so that the kingdom that we take possession of cannot be shaken. You see that? In Isaiah 7, 14 to 16, this exemplifies for us the perfect plan of the Most High in the nurturing and training stage 
that Eve failed at. She did not persevere until she was mature enough in the faith to know to refuse evil and choose good. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. So in this text, we see that there is this nurturing and training stage that needs to take place so that the child needs to first know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Think about it. Evil only exists or comes to life in the absence of good. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, it actually bears two types of fruit. Now, if you think about it, do you know of any trees that bear two types of fruit? That's pretty unusual, right? That alone is unusual in and of itself since trees are supposed to only bear one fruit after its kind. And yet, Genesis 3, 6 says that Eve took of its fruit, singular, and ate. So my question is, remember, she's immature. She hasn't completed the perfection of love that the Creator is intending for her. So because she's immature, she's not ready. And the text seemed to imply she only took one fruit. Which fruit do you think she chose? And remember, she's not ready to discern between good and evil. We live in a world of duality. Now, I believe as a result of the fall, we find ourselves living in a world of duality. There is darkness and light. There's good, there's bad, there's up and down. But let's think a little bit here. Darkness, if you think about it, really only exists in the absence of light. Think about this. All negativity can only exist in the absence of positivity. Evil only exists in the absence of good. So what Eve did was open the door of duality. And you know, she knew this in her flesh. She now knows good and evil just like the sons of God or the angelic beings knowing good and evil, and yet sinned against the Most High, despite of being in the very presence of the Creator. Adam and Eve were set apart for a purpose, and their purpose is found in Psalms 8, verse 4 to 6, says, Of what importance is the human race that you should notice them? Of what importance is mankind that you should pay attention to them? and make them a little less than the heavenly beings. You grant mankind honor and majesty. You appoint them to rule over your creation. You have placed everything under their authority. And so Adam and Eve were created, set apart for a purpose. And they are unique. They are different in a sense because they are made less than the heavenly beings and yet they get to rule over the creation. They are granted honor and majesty and everything placed under their authority. And so this is why partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil at an immature stage has opened such a profound ramification of consequence because the creator is using The Creator is setting apart Adam and Eve to also teach the heavenly beings a lesson. And so did you notice that I kept referring to the person of Eve who disobeyed, who ate from the fruit? I kept referring to her and her alone. And there's a reason for that. And so remember, Eve is a type of our soul. And there's a reason why I only singled her out as the one who was deceived by the serpent. And this is why Adam came to the rescue. Romans 5.14 says something quite interesting. And it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. 
even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So if you take your time to examine this part of the scripture, you're going to see that Paul was using Adam as a type of Yahushua, Jesus the Messiah, who was to come. And now you look to 1 Timothy 2, 14. It says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. So Adam is a typology of who was to come. So Adam is a type of Redeemer. And we will cover this in further detail in the next presentation. Thank you. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Thank <laughs> you.